Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to the HRB for inviting me. Uh, it's great to see such a packed room of people with such diverse uh, interests in personalised medicine. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, so what I'm going to try and do in 15 or 20 minutes is give you a flavour for why uh, personalised medicine might be important in neurology, why it might be important in the epilepsies, and give three specific examples, and we've heard from uh, colleagues earlier on about how important in terms of telling governments, telling funders that yes, this stuff actually makes a difference to people's lives and also can be cost effective. So um, we don't really talk about epilepsy anymore. It's really the epilepsies and uh, the epilepsies can be defined as a common group of brain disorders affecting individuals of all ages a varying and often unknown cause, near, nearly um, maybe 45% still, even by best analysis in, in, the, in the best centres. We still don't understand why many of our patients uh, don't de uh, develop epilepsy. Of course, a lot of this now is genetic or, 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 or oligogenic and, and polygenic, so it is co uh, complicated. And epilepsy is clinically characterised by recurrent unprovoked seizures. That's the traditional diagnosis, and now since um, an update by the International League Against Epilepsy in 2017, if an individual has one unprovoked seizure but has an enduring predisposition to further seizures, for example, if they've got spike and wave on their EEG or if they've got a potentially epileptogenic lesion uh, on, on imaging, then it, it, we would envisage that that patient has a high chance of, of developing further seizures, so we would treat them as if they... Uh, we, 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 use, we, we basically say that they have epilepsy. Um, the epilepsies, of course, have significant consequences in terms of adverse educational, uh, vocational, psychosocial functioning. An obvious one that we deal with all the time is driving privileges because people have to be free of functionally disabling seizures for one year or longer before they can drive. And then, of course, there's the issues around physical morbidity. People injure themselves. People uh, experience burns uh, because of their seizures. I had one patient I saw last week who had a 30-minute focal seizure with impaired awareness, just a very blind staring episode, but it happened while he was pouring uh, a cup of tea uh, or out of a pot of just boiled uh, tea, and he had a 30-second seizure, and he spent three weeks in the burns unit in St. James's Hospital. So this, is, th this, this group of conditions is, is obviously extremely important, and then patients can die from seizures, and there's this issue of sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So, um, and all these are, of course, important in people with refractory epilepsy. Um, we use drugs to treat epilepsy. We use dirty, coarse drugs that try and block sodium channels and block, uh, uh, activate GABA, and these are some examples of drugs that we've been using over the years. We call broad-spectrum drugs if we believe that they're going to be effective in a broad range of epilepsies, narrow-spectrum usually in terms of focal epilepsy. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read all the slides, and I am from Cork, so I speak very quickly. And now on, on, on the right hand of this slide, more and more we're thinking about niche medicines, and niche medicines would be for individual specific syndromes, whether they're genetic or not, and these can be non-precision or precision, and I'll give some examples of, of precision, um, as I say, uh, treatments in a second. Okay, so uh, I don't think I need to... Um, repeat this, but uh, this is from uh, a specific review of precision medicine in the epilepsy it's from Lancet Neurology some years back following a conference, um, and uh, it's really about trying to correct the molecular cause of disease. And of course, I absolutely take the point that was made earlier, it's not just about that, it's about other issues, environmental issues, social issues, but for the purposes, I suppose, of molecular genetics, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, focused on correcting the, the molecular disruption caused by uh, a genetic uh, mutation. Um, so there are many, many uh, genes, there's no such thing as an epilepsy gene, but there's many, many genes, mutations in which can cause epilepsy as the phenotype. Some it's a, sometimes it's a pure epilepsy, sometimes it's related to epilepsy and comorbidities such as intellectual disability. So now there are hundreds of such genes. Um, and these are examples, which I am not going to go through, but um, of epilepsy genes, mutations in which cause a variety of epilepsies, in which precision therapy approaches may make a difference to individual patients. Um, 
how we prove this, of course, is challenging, and we need to think a little bit more about clinical trials in precision medicine as well, because we can't really use the old-fashioned paradigm of N equals to 200, N equals to 300 patients with a phenotype, uh, when you really only have uh, patients with individual genes, maybe two or three in each center across multiple sites across multiple, multiple countries. How do you actually prove something is actually a true precision medicine? So these are just examples. And we can also think about uh, tiers of precision medicine. Uh, and this is from a review that uh, Susan Byrne um, and myself and another colleague published in Developmental Medicine Child Neurology last year. And when you cl practice clinical medicine, uh, you, and certainly in the epilepsies, you know that if somebody has a particular type of epilepsy, a drug will often be effective for that patient without any genetic information. So we're always practicing precision therapeutics. So we can go up, uh, up this if you, pathway, if you like, and of course the holy grail will be, and I, I don't think anybody mentioned it yet today, and I'm certainly no expert, but we are... Uh, we are already into the world of gene therapy and gene replacement therapy. Within neurology itself, we have uh, specific genetic therapies now for the sp spinal muscular atrophies uh, in childhood that are very effective. Of course, also very expensive, so there are societal questions about how we actually pay for a lot of these precision therapies, including the genetic, uh, including gene therapy. So, um, just just, just want to make the point that there are different levels of precision therapies. Okay, so there's no such thing as precision therapy when we're talking about genetics without precision diagnostics. And if we're not doing um, appropriate genetic testing, whether that's single gene testing or whether it's whole exome or whole genome testing, then we cannot practice precision therapeutics. We need precision diagnostics. So, as I mentioned, the molecular genetic etiologies of some of the epilepsies are now established. Um, there, we, there are no known etiology for many individuals still with epilepsy, but this is changing. Within the field of epilepsy, up to very recently, we have not been thinking at all about etiology. So we've said somebody has temporal lobe epilepsy, somebody has a syndrome called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, but we haven't been thinking enough about what the actual cause is. And this is, this is rampant across medicine. I mean, if you stay with neurodevelopmental disorders, we talk about people having an intellectual disability. We talk about somebody having autism. What, what, what's the cause of the intellectual disability? What's the cause of, of the autistic spectrum disorders? So a lot of these people have uh, monogenic uh, conditions that are undiagnosed. I can guarantee you there are people attending epilepsy clinics, complex epilepsy clinics. There are people in care centers with intellectual disability. There are children with autism attending day centers, and none of them have had all whole exome sequencing. And many of them, probably 30%, have a, have, a, have a molecular cause that we don't know about. I mean, right now. So uh, I suppose I do want to make some challenge comments as we go along, and, and it is great, and I'll try uh, for Minister Donnelly to, say, to tell us that uh, finally we're going to have the genetic strategy um, announced and published at the RCPI on the 13th of December. But it, uh, he talks about 3 million for next year to develop a national strategy. It's a drop in the ocean. I mean, if we're going to be able to provide genetic services with appropriate whole exome sequencing, appropriate bioinformatics, appropriate infrastructure, appropriate treatments, appropriate precision treatments, we need a hell of a lot more than 3 million euros. So this, we, we, we I, I congratulate him, but you know, we need a lot more. Uh, when, when Leo Varadkar was Minister for Health, how many years ago was that? That was six, seven, eight years ago. He talked about the importance of genetic medicine uh, in the Doyle. So we really need now, and this is really heartening to see this today, that this is actually going to happen. But we need to tell the minister that 3 million euros is not enough. And hopefully they have plans to actually properly resource the implementation of the genetic strategy. Okay, I'll come off my high horse and move on to the next slide. So what is appropriate genetic testing within the epilepsy? So uh, we can't test everybody. Of course, we can argue that maybe in 10 years' time, every neonate will have whole exome sequencing so that that information can be used for the healthcare journey of that individual over the course of his or her life. But right now, I certainly wouldn't advocate 
doing whole exome se sequencing and spending that money in somebody who presents with new onset epilepsy. But there are clearly now groups of people with epilepsy where we should be doing appropriate genetic testing. So I've mentioned some of these already. So these would be patients with comorbid intellectual disability, uh, specific pediatric epilepsy syndromes, where there is a strong family history of epilepsy, where there are other additional features to suggest a multi-system disorder, patients with unexplained phenotype, that's more a general neurology statement, patients with non-lesional uh, focal or multifocal epilepsy, patients with cortical developmental malformations and cavernomas, and um, also I think patients with severe ultra-refractory epilepsy regardless of the syndromic diagnosis. So, um, myself and colleagues, including Gian Piero Cavallari, who's my colleague in RCSI, who's in the room, have had a long interest in um, epilepsy genetics research, and we have uh, been, um, we, we started a multidisciplinary uh, epilepsy genomics meeting quite a few years back, and that's developed as a very useful uh, educational tool in our department over the years, where we have clinicians, uh, researchers, nurse researchers, bioinformaticians, where we go over um, uh, exome uh, uh, sequencing data to see if we can, uh, and where, where we go over phenotype to see if we can decide whether a variant is actually pathogenic for this patient's phenotype. And then if we believe it is, we send the, um, we, we replicate it in a, in a confirmed or an accredited laboratory. And, uh, and, and then we will meet with the, pa with the patient and family. And we also have uh, the services of Mary Greeley, who's a, a clinical geneticist. But it's really important that we can't really also practice precision medicines when we're talking about genetic disorders without actually having a whole infrastructure for MDT meetings and going over information and deciding what, what to do about it. Um, by the way, the accredited lab where we send our, um, whether it's straight forward from, straight, straight to the clinic or whether it's from our research uh, 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 pipeline, we, we actually have to send our um, samples to Germany to see that. So again, I'm not sure how much money that's costing the Irish taxpayer. We're also bringing in this into our epilepsy surgery review, review meeting. So we're talking about genetics, not only in, in medical terms, but also in surgical terms. So I, I see that I'm running out of time. I'm going to skip, I'm going to give you the three examples. There's been a lot of interest in the mtoropathies uh, related to tuberous sclerosis complex, but I'm just going to go on to these three examples because this is what I've been asked to do. So I'm going to give three specific examples in a few minutes. So number one is adjustment of existing anti-seizure medicine. So this is a 41-year-old man with a background of non-specific autism and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. What that means is the patient has multiple seizure types, has cognitive abnormalities, and has a specific EEG abnormality. He's a lifelong history of epilepsy since age six months and associated intellectual disability. He originally presented with infantile spasms, regular tonic-clonic seizures with injuries, and behavioral anger outbursts. He found COVID difficult. I was asked to see him as a second opinion in, in April 2021. When I, was, when I saw him, he was on a variety of different drugs. His epilepsy got worse. Um, he, lamotrigine was increased. He, he, he got worse. There was more frequent seizures. He fairly fractured his hand, et cetera, et cetera. We said we'd, we'd admit him to our epilepsy monitoring unit. And as part of his evaluation, when he was in the epilepsy monitoring unit, we did um, whole exome sequencing, uh, which was sent to Seagat in Germany, and we, we got back a pathogenic mutation in the gene called SCN1A, which it codes for a subunit of the uh, sodium channel. Uh, so uh, we know that sodium channel blockers such as lamotrigine often make these patients worse. So we stopped the lamotrigine and we added in levetiracetam. He's become seizure free. I spoke to his mother recently and she said that his whole, his parents, his elderly parents, of course, who worry about what's going to happen to their adult a child with disability is are just delighted. He's had no more seizures. His whole co countenance has changed, and he, this, so these she this individual has adult Dravet syndrome. Dravet syndrome is something that should be diagnosed at age one, two, or three, and it was diagnosed at age in his forties. Now, of course, you wouldn't have been able to diagnose when he was three, but so fifty-year-old man seizures since he was a teenager. Uh, he had an evaluation. Basically, he had non-lesional parietal lobe epilepsy. He was having two to three seizures every night. As part of our research um, work, we found that he had a pathogenic mutation in a gene called DEPDEC5, which is part of the mTOR complex. And we know that Everolimus treats uh, tuberous sclerosis complex. So 
Following informed consent, we treated him, this man, with uh, Everolimus. He was having seizures every night. Uh, he was intellectually normal, but just his whole, he was just wrecked from having seizures every night. Um, and we started him on uh, Everolimus here. This is his baseline monthly seizure frequency. We started Everolimus. He's still on Everolimus. He still has some seizures, but this is his monthly seizure account. He feels much better. His quality of life is much better. And this is a repurposing uh, precision therapy. And then the last one, very briefly, is not all precision therapy is about medicine. Not all precision therapy is about gene replacement therapy. So this is a 48-year-old lady with a long history of generalized epilepsy, idiopathic generalized epilepsy, since age three years different seizure types, highly refractory to many standard anti-seizure medicines over the years. We did research sequencing in October 2019. We confirmed a pathogenic variant in SEL2A1, which is the gene uh, that it's, it's another, um, it encodes GLUT1, which is a glucose transporter, and this is a form of GLUT1 uh, GLUT deficiency uh, syndrome, which causes a different a variety of phenotypes, including movement disorders. So this was confirmed. He was referred to my colleague Colin Doherty in St. James's, who runs an adult ketogenic diet service, because we know from the literature that this condition, because it's a failure to transport glucose across the blood-brain barrier, uh, responds very well to the ketogenic diet. Colin and his colleague, we're now co, co this patient is under co-care with ourselves and Colin's team. Uh, she was put on the ketogenic diet, much better, better seizure control. She's not seizure free, but she's feeling much better. She feels much clearer, much more energy, and she remains on the diet with, with good support. So again, I'm what, very briefly, maybe you can kick me off. We, we, we also need to think about clinical trials. We need to think about how we're going to pr prove precision uh, therapies with new small molecules. We need registers of patients with mutations in different genes across centers, and we want to start that in Ireland. There's also difficulty on the ground. If you're a busy clinician, uh, it, it, the whole issue around ethics approval and data transfer agreements, this is, you know, we've got such an opportunity to do great work, but we really, ye guys, whoever I'm looking at out there, need to make it easier for us to do clinical research. I'm not, I'm in no space to sit down and write um, and, and go through data processing agreements. I just, I just won't do it. I mean, it's just head wrecking, right? So you need to make, make us be able to do this kind of research. We also need, last comment, um, apart from acknowledgements, which I won't call out, last comment, um, what was my last comment? I just, I just forgot my last comment. <laughs> uh, I was gonna, is, um, I don't know. Um, Anyway, make, make it easy for us to do this kind of research because uh, patients and families, and it's great to see the patient and family's voice here today, really want this and they want to be able to, to, to get access to these kind of treatments. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Sorry I was rushed a bit. <laughs>